All right, let's go to the Bible together. Let's go to a passage of scripture that it would be my guess, probably everybody is familiar with, even if you've never been in church in your whole life, I bet you might have at least heard of this story from the Bible. I wanna look at the instance where Jesus feeds 5,000 people. We're gonna be in John chapter six. Uh, Jesus feeds 5,000 and um, interesting to note that during this time when they would go to record a number like that, they would only count the men. And so um, counting in the women, the children that were no doubt there, this would have been a number, you know, Bible scholars say would have been close to maybe 15,000 or so. They're gonna get miraculously fed here. Come on, that's a lot of Ivers being passed around the crowd. It's also interesting to note that as far as I can find, this is the only miracle that's listed in all four gospels other than the resurrection. And so it would be my take that there's something that the Lord wants us to catch here. And so let's look at John's take on um, this miracle moment and then I'm gonna grab a few more other verses from the other accounts as well to fill it all in. John chapter six, verse four, Jesus has been healing the sick. Uh, the crowd is going after Jesus, going wherever Jesus goes, because how many know there just comes a point where you've tasted of God's goodness enough that you're like, Jesus, wherever you go, that's where I'm gonna go. Yeah. And it becomes much less about where you are or what you're doing and much more about who you're with. And so that's where these people are. Now, verse four, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, hey, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this, is, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered and said, 200 denarii would, uh, worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little, even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a, uh, much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So if you want some more, get some more. Verse 12, so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets, with fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Uh, let's conclude our reading there for now. I wanna preach uh, just for the next few minutes uh, from this subject, living on leftovers, living on leftovers. I'm gonna be fairly brief with this. I wanna use what God put in my spirit to sort of set us up for an opportunity that we have today as a church. Uh, but let me preach from living on leftovers. How many know that there's, there's basically, I love leftovers kind of people, and then there's, I never eat leftovers kind of people. And they're all among us here today. Um, you ever work with somebody, or maybe you even live with somebody? I don't mean to, to talk about my kids, but have you ever maybe lived with somebody that just completely disregards all the rules that should be applied to leftovers? My, my kid, doesn't matter what I write on that styrofoam box, this is the property of your father. Do not touch under legal obligation. You will be sued in the court of law. They don't care, they open it up, they eat it, and they leave a mess on the counter. But you know, generally, generally speaking, there's people that like, they, they love leftovers, or they, they, there's other people, they can't stand leftovers, they don't want anything to do with it. But, but I say all that to make this point. I, I can't really put myself on either side because, because here's what I wanna say. There are certain types of food. Come on, there are certain dishes that are just better as leftovers. <laughs> just certain types. Yeah. Let me hit you with a few. How about, how about pasta? Come on, everybody knows, pasta's better as a leftover. It just kind of soaks it up. How, how, here's another one. How about Thai food? Yeah. Come on, it was good, but then as leftover, it's good-er. It's so good. And it struck me as I read this, that after the disciples had distributed this miracle meal, thousands of people, the expectation of Jesus was that they would live on the leftovers in the kingdom. Maybe not outside of the kingdom, but if you're in the kingdom, it's always better to live to give and to be generous and to consider others and to be somebody that 
watch me, that doesn't sit down to be served, but to be somebody who stands up to serve. In fact, everybody that was served, what they get? They, they got a meal, and that was a blessing. But, but the disciples that stood up and did the serving, they walked away with a whole basket. Even though they had handed out thousands of meals, what was left was more than they had before. Before they served the crowd, they didn't even have enough after they, they served. They, they didn't have enough for themselves, but then they walked away with more. Let me tell you something. That's miracle math. That's, that's miracle math. And every believer should be able to do at least a little bit, at least rudimentary miracle math. Come on, I don't want to be talking about geometry or algebra. That's, I, feel, I still feel stress hit my heart when I just even talk about pre-algebra. I, I slid into graduation with, a, come on, a D plus in pre-algebra, and I was proud of it. My parents were proud of it. Good job. You did it. I want to talk about trigonometry. But, but we should be able to do some miracle math. Miracle math. I want to give us just a few observations that I felt like I saw on the text. You ever read the Bible and, and, and it just looks like, you know, the, the Holy Spirit just bold something in yellow Holy Spirit highlighter? It'll be that way sometimes when I read scripture. It, it caught my attention that the disciples, they had decided and they came to Jesus and, and, and they told Jesus, hey, Jesus, it's getting late. It's late. Why was it late? Because Jesus had been preaching long. Which is biblical proof that the best, most anointed and powerful preaching is always a little long. I guarantee you the disciples did not have a clock set up like my team does for me. Come on. <laughs> You're like, Jesus can preach long for you. I need to get to lunch. So, so, all right. I get it. I get it. But, but the disciples, they had decided, hey, it's late. Have you, have you ever decided and went and told the Lord and, and went and complained to the Lord? Have you ever said to Jesus, Jesus is getting late. I thought I would be further along by now. I thought this would have changed by now. I didn't think I'd still be stuck in this same kind of situation at this point and, and by now. It's, it's late. And, and the reason they said it was late is because they were looking at this situation from a completely, in a, in a general way, they were looking at this situation from a perspective that was 100% natural. But Jesus looks at the same situation, and Jesus doesn't see it from a perspective that's natural, but from one that's supernatural. And the difference is this. In the natural, to feed all those people would have been really slow. But from a supernatural perspective, what would have been slow happens, come on, suddenly. There is a suddenly for somebody in the house today. And I know it feels like it's getting late. I know it feels like the clock is ticking. I know it feels like there's not much time. But I'm telling you, when Jesus gets involved, you move out of the realm of slow and into the realm of suddenly. Suddenly. But, but it's, it's timing, you know. It's timing. It's timing with God. I, I've, I've never... Personally, and maybe, maybe you're the same way, maybe you can identify, I, I've never struggled that much with knowing that God was gonna do something, that God was gonna bring a touch, but I think sometimes it's, I've struggled with God's timing. God, thanks, but, but it would have been better last year. Come on, have you ever been there? Because the later it got, the hungrier the disciples were getting, the later it got, the hungrier the crowd was getting, and Jesus wasn't about to let them starve. But before dinner came, Jesus wanted to do something more important. Jesus wanted to feed their spirits. I'm telling you, there's something about getting hungry enough for this that you are willing to go without that. When you get hungry enough for one thing, you don't mind going without another thing. And there was a crowd there that day that was hungry enough to sit under the one that was doing miracles that they just weren't that worried about their next meal. Some. Can I just say something? Sometimes I think we get so full of what we don't need that we're not actually hungry for what we actually really do need. Is there some stuff, believer, that you're willing to go without? Is there some stuff, maybe an idea or, or a perspective or, or maybe even the way you've seen yourself? Are, are you willing to go without something because there's something else that you've gotten hungry enough to say, you know what? That, that, that doesn't matter compared to what does matter. I got to get in God's presence. I got to hear your voice, God. I have to draw near to the one that's called me and redeemed me. I've lost my appetite, God, for anything but you. Come on, is anybody hungry for God today? I really love 
how John's gospel brings this out, this, this part out, because it's in all four gospels, we get these unique perspectives. They're all, they're all accurate, but they're unique perspectives, kind of like, you know, right there on, on this, you know, row, you're seeing something different than, than you in the back row, but it's all accurate, it's just different, you know what I'm saying? And, and so John kind of brings out this conversation that happens between Jesus and a few of the disciples, and um, John goes to the trouble to record this where, where Jesus says to Philip, and this ministers to me because it reminds me of some of the conversations I've had with the Lord. Um, you know, when the disciple, whenever the disciples are doing something dumb, I'm like, yep, me too. Come on, anybody? I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't call like rocket scientists and people that had it all together and, and people with all, I'm like, ah, I can, I can, get, on, I can get down with that. That's, that reminds me of me. Come on, somebody. Because Jesus asked Philip, and as there's this large crowd of people all around, Jesus asked Philip, um, hey, where should we go? to buy all these people something to eat. And the Bible includes this, that Jesus only said this as a test. You know what's important to know when you're trying to pass a test is to know you're taking a test. What test are you in right now? Jesus says, Philip, where are we gonna go to buy bread for all these people? And, and Philip's response is like, um, Lord, uh, it would cost more than half a year's wages to buy bread for all these people and um, don't get me wrong, we, we love it that we left everything to, you know, go where you go, but I don't know if you know this or not, but like my income has kind of changed. I'm not really, it hasn't been all that lucrative to follow you, Jesus. I, I'm broke. I can't buy no bread. That's not all in the text. I'm just bringing it alive for you today, okay? <laughs> but what Philip is basically saying is up against the amount of people, Lord, when it comes to feeding all of them, we've got nothing. I don't know what you're up against, what the need is, what you're going through, but I bet you there's a few people in this room that are in that part of the conversation and you've been telling the Lord, Lord, I've got nothing. But Jesus is working with the disciples here and Jesus is working with us here. And, and another disciple now speaks up. Andrew says, well, there's this kid here with a few fishes and loaves. And this is also not in the text, but it's implied in the text that they must have stolen this kid's Lunchable. <laughs> and, and because now they're telling Jesus, Jesus, well, we do have something. Because it's never nothing. I guarantee you, no, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your life looks like right now, it's never nothing. You've always got something. But here's the question. How far will these few fishes and loaves go among so many, which is to say it, it's, it's something, but it's not enough. So, so now we've moved in this conversation from it's nothing to it's not enough. Maybe that's where you're at. It's not enough. My education's not enough. My, my experience is not enough. My, my talent, my resource, my, my looks, my whatever. It's not enough. It's not enough. But I'm telling you what, if you will get what's in your hands into God's, if you will get what's in your hands into God's, if you can find a way to get it from your hand into his, it'll always look like not enough until it becomes more than enough. Because it always, it's always that way. It, it always looks like not enough. How many know that, that Moses, a stuttering fugitive, looked like not enough? Like, really, this one, God, this is what you're going to send? How many know that David, a teenage shepherd with a sling, up against a giant named Goliath looked like not enough. Gideon with a pitiful army of 300 looked like not enough. A few fishes and a few loaves looked like not enough. It's always gonna look like not enough until you get it into the hands of the God of more than enough. So, so what's Jesus doing with the disciples? Jesus is showing them something that I would suggest we still need to see We've got we've to set our focus on what we do have, what we do have, because the enemy always wants you to focus on what you don't have. Uh, some of the best lies of the enemy, some of the most well-crafted lies of, of the deceiver, that one that is the chief of lies, some of the best lies are the ones that are wrapped in a whole lot of facts, because there might be a long list of facts all about what you don't have. It's a fact. You, you, there might be a whole lot that you don't have, and, and that is a fact. But, but the miracle that God has for your life, God has to do through your life, 
The miracle is always initiated when you stop looking at what you don't have and you look at what you do have. E even if it's nothing more than a little bit of oil in the cupboard during a famine. Y'all remember that one? Where this, this widow, Elijah, the, the powerful prophet, comes and Elijah's like, hey, why don't you give me something? What was Elijah doing? Elijah was setting up for a miracle because what happened next? She says, well, I got nothing. And then, again, this is not in the text, but you're like, you're going a lot of in between the lines here, preacher. <laughs> but, but when she says nothing, it's a, the way I see it, it's almost like Elijah looks back and like, really? Really, you're going to tell me nothing? I know you got something. Really? Because, because then she says, well, I do have something. I got a little bit of oil. And, and the conversation she had with Elijah moves in the exact same progression as this conversation that the disciples had with Jesus. They went from we got nothing to we got something, but it's not enough. And I hear the Lord saying to somebody today, stop telling me what you don't have and offer me what you do have. You know, I get to thinking about, you know, where God has taken my wife and I and, and what God's done with our life. And, you know, if, if, we did, if we did anything right when we planted the cause church, I'll tell you this. We certainly did not sit down and, and, and encourage our faith by making a gigantic list of everything that we didn't have. That we wouldn't have had enough paper. You know what I mean? We, we, we wouldn't have enough, enough space on our laptop to make that list. I mean, like, like let me see. We didn't have, um, here's something that's pretty important when it comes to building a church. We didn't have people. <laughs> we didn't have musicians. We didn't have much for experience. We didn't have systems. We didn't have a network. We didn't have a budget. We didn't, I mean, it's getting depressing, and I could just keep going and going and going. But when I remember back, if we did anything right, you know what I think we did? We didn't, we didn't talk about it this way at the time, but now looking back, you know what I think we did is we gave God our not enough. God, I don't have a building, but I have a living room. I know it's not enough. Come on, somebody. God, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I do, you've stirred my heart and I got a whole lot of passion to see people that are far from God come into saving and healing and transforming relationship with Jesus. So here you go, Lord. Here's my not enough. So, so can you give God your not enough? Because if the enemy can't keep you blind to what you do have, the next best move is just to convince you that it's not worth anything. It's not worth offering to God and, you know, Andrew was really the one, in, in my opinion, in this account, with the one with really crazy faith. You know, somebody one time said, you got to be slightly crazy to do something great for God. Come on, somebody. I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> you know what made Andrew crazy is because Andrew, Andrew was the one that was like, Jesus, um, we have a few fish. That was crazy. Look, look because... It was like, I'm, I'm looking at a few fish, and then I'm looking back at this crowd of 15,000. Then I'm looking at a few fish, and, and then I'm looking at this crowd. They look hungry, and I'm looking at the fish, and now I'm looking at the crowd, and it's crazy. It's crazy. Here's the question I want to ask. Can you be the kind of disciple that hears the, the buzz and the roar and the energy of a huge crowd? It feels the, the pressure of an overwhelming need to, to realize how great the job ahead is and to still say, Lord... Here's my few fishes and loaves. Here's my not enough. It, it, it feels like nothing, but, but at the same time, it still is something. Because can I tell you something? God has never needed what you don't have. God has ever only wanted everything that you do have. And if we'd get that like a revelation, it would take the pressure off and we would realize God can actually use us in our life and use us in our family and use us in the earth. God doesn't need who you're not. God just needs who you are. You got to be careful, though, with our clapping. Because, because this miracle shows us something else. Some of us, has been, we've been waiting for God to do it for us. And this miracle shows us that God wants to do it through us. See, now the clapping dies out. I heard a few amens from the super sanctified Christians. Because Jesus says, 
Jesus says something in Matthew 14, 16. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Jesus is like, I'm, I've been preaching all day. I'm tired. You give them something to eat. I've been doing miracles. I've been healing the sick. You give them something to eat. And the problem for them was not only did they not know how, but watch this. Please catch this. They themselves were also hungry. <laughs> Let me stay here for just a minute because they'd been ministering with Jesus. They, they'd been working. They were tired and they were hungry. So, so this, is, this is actually the real question of, of ministry. This, this separates those that want to and, and those that actually will. If you want to encourage somebody, if, if, if you want to help somebody into healing, if, if you want to show somebody the, the road to restoration, if, if, if something in your heart is saying, oh, God, use me. Here's the question. Can you be the kind of person that feeds others when you're still hungry? Because I'm telling you, if, if you wait to go until you're well rested, come on, until there's no more bags under your eyes, until you're properly caffeinated, until your schedule's freed up, if... If, 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 if you wait to go till you're, you know, well fed in a decade from now, guess what you're going to be doing? You're still going to be waiting. Jesus was showing the disciples something. You got to be willing to do what you're called to do even when you're hungry. Even when your spiritual blood sugar is a little off. Even, even when you got your own problems. Even when you got your own needs. Come on. Have you ever been sitting there listening to somebody's prayer request and you're like, are you serious? This might just be the moment in the sermon where I get free therapy by just, you know. <laughs> but, but it's like somebody's prayer, you know, hey, just come on, like, just pray for me. Just, just come on, would you lay hands on me? Because my dog, she's just going through some really bad anxiety right now. I need you to pray. <laughs> and on the inside, you're freaking out with a million problems of your own, but you're like, I'm going to lay my hands on you. Have, have, you ever, have you ever had God anoint you to help somebody else? Like you knew that God anointed you to help somebody, but you walk away and you still need healing of your own? Jesus is stretching them and, and Jesus is, is, is helping us with a principle. If we keep operating out of our convenience, we will never grow in our capacity. You, you got to have a yes in your spirit, a yes when you're hungry, a yes when you're frustrated, a yes when you've been burned by people, a yes when the situation doesn't make any sense. Can you go and release heaven in their life when it feels like the enemy's releasing hell in yours? So I say as a church, we don't wait until we're full to get somebody else fed. Because here's what happens. Sometimes it's through the process of making sure they're fed that you get full. That's why James said, lay hands on the sick that you yourself may recover. Sometimes the power comes in the process. Process. Because watch what happens. Jesus tells the disciples, have everybody sit down in groups of 50. And this was going to take a minute because there were thousands. And, and it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a way, of, it's a principle that if we want to see God work, we got to do it God's way. We don't invent new ways. God has a way. It's a Bible way. Why do you lay hands on sick people? Because that's what Jesus said to do. You see what I'm saying? Why do you lift up your hands and work? Because that's what Jesus said to do. Um, and, and they do all of that. And then it says, Jesus takes the fishes and loaves and looking up to heaven. This is the key phrase in this entire passage. It says, Jesus blessed and broke them. Blessed and broke them. Blessing and breaking Breaking and blessing, you can't have one without the other. So that which refuses to be broken is also refusing to be blessed. They offered up what they had. And then Jesus took it from them, broke it. And, and they feed the multitude, and then here comes the blessing. They help the multitude, here comes the blessing. They, they, they minister to the multitude, here comes the blessing. And God didn't just do a miracle for them, but did the miracle through them. Let me tell you what maturing in Christianity sounds like. When, when we mature, we, we pray less prayers that sound like this. Oh God, do something for me. And we pray more prayers that sound like this. God, would you do something through me? God, would you use me? Would you do something through me? And here's the result. Matthew 14, 20. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. 
See, if we'll give God what we've got, God will, God will break us and then God will bless us. And, and living that kind of life, God, here's my whole heart. Living on what, this is, this is when I give God my whole life, I've got blessed leftovers. Whatever's left is blessed. I got, I got more than what I came with. Everyone else, you know, they got a meal. And, and for some of us, it's, it's like there might even be an opportunity, just even, even in this atmosphere, just there's a shift in your spirit to move out of that season where it's like I'm the one getting a meal and now I'm going to stand up and I'm going to serve and I'm going to be the one that's participating in a miracle. Because when you take what you have, you get it in God's hands. Insufficient becomes sufficient. Not enough becomes more than enough. We're living on the leftovers. Come on. I'm going to give all myself. I'm going to live on the leftovers. And, and it says Jesus was moved with compassion for the people. You know, miracles always flow through compassion. I don't know if there's ever been a more important time. Maybe every generation says this. Maybe they should. But I don't know that there's ever been a more important time that we as believers are moved with compassion for people. Lost people, hurting people, broken people, confused people, that we're moved with compassion. 